What is truth? What is fact? And why does it matter? If, as has been suggested, journalism is the rough draft of history, then we are editing that rough draft tonight. Good evening. My name is Rosemary McGee, and I'm honored to serve as the director of the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library at Emory University. I have a very important job, and I have another one that I'm going to tell you very quickly. Please make sure you have silenced your mobile devices. Take a second for that. On behalf of my colleagues at Emory, including the Emory Libraries, the Short Center for the Performing Arts, Emory College of Arts and Sciences, and my fellow board members of the Decatur Book Festival, I'm most pleased tonight to welcome you, the readers, the scholars, the students, the teachers, the poets, the journalists, the dreamers, all believers in the power of writing in our lives. Clearly, this is a time and place where truth matters. Here at Emory, our faculty, staff, alumni, and students are all deeply immersed in the primary evidence of ideas, stories, and meaning. Attending to the narratives that weave our lives together into moments both intimate and public, troubling and transparent. That is what the AJC Decatur Book Festival is all about. And the keynote event sets a very fine stage for all that is to transpire. On this very stage, over the past few years, we've been enlightened by John Lewis, enthralled by Natasha Trethewey, intrigued by Joyce Carol Oates, Roxane Gay, and so many others. Our guests tonight, as part of this keynote event, are part of a most distinguished lineage. How does this magic happen? Here to share with us the secret formula that has made the Decatur Book Festival sizzle, pop, and fizz every year for the past 12 years, including this one, is our orchestrator, our role model, our collaborator, thus far unindicted co-conspirator, <laughs> novelist and creative spirit at large, our friend, the incomparable Darren Wong, executive director of the Decatur Book Festival. Honest to God, I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> um, if you ever want to know what they're, they're going to say at your funeral, I would suggest you uh, quit your job. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, the, the 12 years of working on the Decatur Book Festival um, has, has taught me uh, countless things. Uh, I've always understood uh, what community means. And it's an over, uh, overused word. I remember uh, um, when, uh, uh, I guess it's 18 years ago when I was looking to uh, uh, move to Decatur and I'd just met my, what would be my future wife, my current wife uh, at the time. Uh, my only wife, the only wife I'll ever have. I want to make that all clear. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, um, I, I was living in, in Ansley Park and uh, um, I, I was thinking about moving and I decided uh, um, I came out to Decatur um, and uh, looked around and I decided I want to live in Decatur and uh, um, she, she said to me she said well, you know why would you go from living in the middle of everything to living out out here <laughs> and um, I knew at the time that that there was um, you know, even even then, the, the sidewalks worked in Decatur. That seems a crazy statement, but but um, people knew each other. There was there was always a, um, a camaraderie and a community in there that that um, I never felt 
anywhere else I lived in, in Atlanta. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I feel lucky to have been uh, part of the Decatur Book Festival and to, to have been, uh, uh, to have watched other people's creativity um, blossom um, and to have been, been a small part of that. So, uh, um, thank you, thank you all for, uh, um, for for being here tonight and uh, um, being part of my uh, harebrained scheme, my harebrained dream. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Julie Wilson, program director of the AJC Decatur Book Festival. Before I introduce our keynote participants, I'd like to welcome uh, pa Mayor Patty Garrett to the podium for a short presentation to honor Darren Wong for his contribution to the city of Decatur. And I'm gonna ask Darren if he will come back up here, please. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to say um, it is truly my honor to be able to present this proclamation on behalf of the city of Decatur to um, our friend and um, inspiration in the city of Decatur. Whereas Darren Wong, co-founder of the AJC Decatur Book Festival, will step down in 2018, and whereas Darren Wong has served as executive director of the festival for 12 years since its inception in 2006, and whereas under Darren's leadership, the festival has grown from relatively modest beginnings to become the largest independent book festival in the country, and whereas Darren Wong and his self-proclaimed harebrained scheme has been an integral part of raising the profile of Decatur as a center of the creative arts, literature, and literacy, and whereas the festival contributes to the economic and cultural vitality of Decatur where authors are rock stars, and whereas Darren Wong exemplifies the values of creativity, inclusivity, and sense of community. Now, therefore, I, Patricia M. Garrett, Mayor of the City of Decatur, the City of Homes, Schools, and Places of Worship, do hereby pro proclaim Saturday, September 2nd, 2017, as Darren Wong Day. <laughs> And I do hereby urge all citizens and organizations of this community to join me in extending appropriate honors and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Garrett. One of our goals for the festival each year is to celebrate writing that has an impact. This year's keynote program fits perfectly into that framework as it tackles the role of journalism in our current environment. These days, the free press is under attack. We are bombarded by information 24-7, overwhelmed by social media and propaganda machines and the abundance of fake news. Our panelists today represent different perspectives of journalism in today's world, from what they cover to how they cover it. Our first panelist, Brooke Gladstone, is the co-host of the Peabody Award-winning radio show and podcast, On the Media. She was also a Moscow-based NPR reporter, senior editor for NPR's All Things Considered, and the senior editor of the Weekend Edition with Scott Simon. She's received numerous awards for her work, including two Peabody Awards, a National Press Club Award, and an Overseas Press Club Award. 
In May 2017, she published The Trouble with Reality, a rumination on moral panic in our time, which examines the precarious nature of reality, especially in our current environment, yet offers hope as history has proven that we can recover our belief in reality and our sanity. Um, our second panel, uh, panelist is Carolyn Ryan, the assistant editor in charge of recruitment. <laughs> Oops. Yes. Yep. Yay, book. Sorry. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're keeping it real. <laughs> we did practice, really. <laughs> Carolyn Ryan is the assistant editor in charge of recruitment for the New York Times. She led the Times political coverage during the 2016 political, uh, presidential election <laughs> and served as Washington bureau chief after helping run its Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of then New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. Before coming to the Times, Ryan worked for the Boston Globe, where she held several editorial positions. Before joining the Globe, Ryan was a State House bureau chief for the Boston Herald. Wesley Lowry is a national reporter for the Washington Post who covers law enforcement. <laughs> Wesley covers law enforcement, justice, race, and politics. He led the paper's coverage of the events in Ferguson, Missouri, and the Black Lives Matter protest movement. Prior to joining the Washington Post, he worked as a breaking news and local politics reporter for the Boston Globe and has also reported for the Los Angeles Times and the Wall Street Journal. In 2014, he was named the National Association of Black Journalists Emerging Journalist of the Year. In September 2016, Wesley published They Won't Kill Us All, which offers a look at the standoff between the police and those they are sworn to protect, showing that civil unrest is just a tool of resistance in the broader struggle for justice. And finally, Kevin Riley is the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. <laughs> We're nothing but smooth up here, really. <laughs> Kevin's held this position since January 2011. He started his career in 1983 at the Dayton Daily News in Ohio while a student at the University of Dayton. While in Ohio, Riley had many roles, including editor-in-chief of Cox Enterprises' four daily Ohio newspapers, publisher of the Springfield News Sun, and general manager for the Ohio online operations. During his time in Atlanta, he has led a rejuvenation of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution with an emphasis on investigative and watchdog journalism. The newspaper won the 2012 Hillman Prize for Newspaper Journalism and was a finalist in the 2013 Goldsmith Investigative Reporting Prize awarded by Harvard University. The AGC was also a recent finalist in the Pulitzer Prize. Please welcome Brooke, Carolyn, Wesley, and Kevin for this engaging and enlightening discussion. Well, good evening. It's so great to be back at the Decatur Book Festival. And uh, you are in for a real treat uh, with this panel. And uh, you should all know that I told them they are in for a real treat, that they will probably never be in front of a better audience that's more interested in what we're going to talk about that reads things more closely and is more demanding of journalism. And I can tell you that firsthand. <laughs> so. Uh, as we prepared for this discussion, we, we, we had some phone calls and, and we've had some conversations. And I have all kinds of great preparation work. I even planned at some point to perhaps even read the First Amendment. Um, <laughs> since our country's leaders seem to need a reminder about it. Um, uh, but, but as we spoke, thank you. We did decide last week when we spoke that we would uh, we could probably depend on some news happening, and uh, and and so we did. Uh, and so we'd like to start the discussion tonight to talk about the hurricane in Texas and, and what's going on. Um, and I'm going to start with Wesley, who was there, who who was just in Houston. Uh, so talk a little bit about what you saw, what's going on there, and what your uh, what your sense of. The, of the media's performance there. Sure, of course. You know, I, I think that 
Houston in the last week. It's now been seven days, so the hurricane made landfall uh, last Friday evening. All right, and so we've hit just a week of this story so far. And I, and I think it's been a clarifying moment not for us in the press who have no issue with our own self-importance and confidence very often, but, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's been clarifying uh, for some of our readers um, about how crucial, especially in a moment of chaos and destruction, having a source of quality information, of quality instruction, a place to turn to. Uh, you know, I, I watched a, a friend of mine uh, who's an anchor in B Beaumont, Texas, you know, guide a woman to the rescue boats last night on live television, right? You, you, you watch her friends at the Houston Chronicle and um, the Galveston News, the oldest newspaper in Texas, serving their community. Um, and I think it's important you know, especially at a time when our politics is so divisive, although I don't know what time in history we'd point to back and say that was less divisive. But at a time when our politics are so divisive, I think it's important for us to be doing work that clarifies and proves to, to the people, to our readers, to citizens, why we are important, right? And so what we've seen the last week or two, I think, last week certainly, has been journalism that someone, and we've, as we've gotten emails from readers, I still think you're liberal idiots who get everything wrong, but that story you just got, did from Texas today was really good. Or, but this is really, this is essential journalism, I appreciate it, do more of this. So I've been working uh, both in Houston and in, and in Washington uh, with our team. You know, we've got probably somewhere between a dozen and two dozen people on the ground, both reporters, videographers, photographers, um, and then a whole group of people in Washington um, who are helping coordinate our coverage, right? And so this is just people being on the ground, physically there, figuring out what's happening. Are people being evacuated? What neighborhoods are flooded? Which ones aren't? Um, telling the, the human stories, beginning to write about, one, the lives that have been lost, um, as well as the lives that have now been changed and upended, and how a community, the fourth largest city in the United States, deals with being largely underwater for, for a week. And so it's been, like I said, a very busy week. I'm not the most well-rested, so when my eyelids start drooping in a few minutes, you're all going to have to forgive me. But, but I, like I said, for me at least, it's been one of those moments uh, that has been rejuvenating, if exhausting, and, and reminding us why we do the work we do. So, so, Carolyn, the Times has a big number of people there. Talk about, you know, what they're doing and why they're there and, and why you know, why it's important to be there. Well, um, we similarly have, I think, about two dozen people who have rotated into Houston, but uh, even more uh, powerful than that, we sort of saw the, the reason and the power of having people on the ground. We have a Houston bureau chief. We also have an energy reporter who's in his 60s named Cliff Krauss, uh, who lives in Bel Air, which is a little city that abuts Houston, and his house was flooded. And one of the stories that readers responded to the most was his tale of trying to gather his belongings from the first floor of his house and bring his artwork, bring his family, bring his little three-year-old dog up and kind of huddle. And he described looking out the window of his house and seeing his neighbor's houses sinking like ships. And you just had this sense of uh, intimacy and suffering. And for our readers, I think like the post, we took down our paywall during this period and the traffic and the response was so um, overwhelming from readers and their gratitude for what we were doing and the emails that came in. And it really struck me because I had just been through the 2016 presidential campaign. And if you remember, um, our president has called reporters uh, disgusting, scum, Low lives, not that I remember this. Uh, <laughs> enemies of the people. Uh, you know, there's been a period of ferocious animosity toward the media. Um, you might have read that the Attorney General has uh, tripled the number of leak investigations. Uh, there's a rhetoric and a tone that I've been in this business for a while and I've never really seen such a barrage of assaults on the press. So the incongruity, watching um, readers, and I think what they were responding to was not just that reporters were doing their jobs, like Wesley, but also the compassion in the heart and the sensitivity. I don't know how many of you saw the CNN reporter who not only helped an elderly man out of his flooded house, but asked the cameras to go away 
when they rescued his wife who had Alzheimer's and he didn't, he was, he didn't want that given her fear and given what the husband had been through to be on the screen. And it was just in that moment that you sense the heart of reporters and that's something that obviously during the presidential campaign uh, has not been much commented on. Right. You know, one of the things I did too was, because um, I was most interested in how the local Houston newspaper was reacting to all of this. And I, I was able to dig up a story that appeared on a, a, the Pointer Institute for Media Studies website. And, and I think this really explains it. This is a um, email to the staff on Sunday from the managing editor, Vernon Lowe. We are heading into a severe flooding emergency and everyone on the Chronicle editorial staff is activated. Please get in touch with and work through your regular supervisor. Assess the roads in your community, begin reporting there, and await further instructions. The story goes on to talk about how the Chronicle has been delivering thousands of papers to shelters and the individual efforts people have made literally wading through water to get to the office and all that stuff. So it, it is a very inspiring story, but Brooke, you sit in that perch above it all as a observer Don't of I the ever. media. How, how are we doing here? Well, there is an arc to coverage of a storm. And the fact of the matter is, people always love the media more when they express what people feel even if the reporting is bad. I mean, there was a great blip after 9-11, that reporting, because even though there were a lot of really wrong things reported, people loved that sense of outrage. Same thing, even worse, during Katrina. People loved the outrage and, and the, the fact that people were expressing their shame, but uh, the reporting really wasn't that good. Uh, you know, the, it is hard work covering a storm, I, I can imagine. I haven't done that. Uh, it's physically hard, but the stories are right there on the ground. It's when you start placing the stories into context, when you start examining why things happen, then storms can become what, uh, what one scholar told me recently, a lesson in federalism, because if you're a Democrat or a liberal, you believe that recovery means building things better so that it won't be as bad the next time, and that's what relief should be. And if you believe in limited government, then you believe that you should send sandbags and blankets and temporary shelters and leave the reconstruction to the churches and the local government and maybe the state government, but it's not the federal government's business to do that. And in order to decide what is appropriate, you have to figure out how were things built, because there's no such thing as a natural disaster. It's not a disaster until people have things there that get destroyed. If there's a big storm in some mountain in the Himalayas, it's not a disaster, even if the entire mountain falls down, unless there are people living there. And, uh, you know, then you have to start considering things like zoning or public education. And all of these are profoundly political issues, and then you've got reporters in the soup again because it's no longer a simple, straightforward story. And, uh, you know, I have some other criticisms. Uh, I think there's an over-reliance on the category system, category four through, or category maybe it's five through, then you've got your tropical storm, your tropical depression. Uh, the categories only refer to wind speed. They don't refer to storm surge. They don't refer to rain. And so if if you use the word downgrade, people may think it's time to go out and, you know, pick up where you left off. And sometimes the worst damage, as in Katrina, as in Houston, happens after the storm is downgraded. So I think that that kind of thing isn't put in enough context. And I think I, I could go on. <laughs> I won't. I'll stop there. I didn't tie it up, but I'll stop there. Well, I, I want to continue, though, because the subject of your book, or rather the title, The Trouble with Reality, and, and um, it, it, the book, of course, talks about the, the whole idea of, of 
whether we can agree on what we perceive or what's happening. At least with a hurricane, we, we can, right? Is it global warming? <laughs> okay, go ahead. I know, I know you're waiting for this question, so go no, ahead. No, I mean, you can both agree that a house has been flattened and that people need to be saved. And that's the story that reporters do on the ground as the event occurs. But beyond that, why the house fell down, why those people were there, who were those people? Because we all know that floods disproportionately affect the poor, because those are the most vulnerable places, and they're usually the most cheap places. Now in Houston, because it's been built up so quickly, and so much of the marshland has just been cemented over, you know, it, it was a much more ecumenical storm than many of them are. Well, Carolyn, the Times did that story today, right? Yeah, absolutely, I mean, what, what? And especially when you compare it to Katrina. Um, one thing I, I do want to recommend to any of you who are really interested in this, there was a project, if you want to get at the why, that uh, ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative uh, foundation that does excellent reporting, did a project a year ago that really captured uh, it's almost a pre-reporting to what happened uh, with Harvey. Wrote and it with the Texas Tribune, called the Boom Texas Town, Tribune. Flood Town. That's right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to take the selfie, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we work in the media, right? Don't we have to be tweeting from up here, everyone smile? All right, we can, we can carry on now. So, uh, let's, let's shift the conversation away a little bit um, to... Uh, you know, kind of more general uh, journalistic issues. And I, I'm just going to start with a question and we can take it wherever it needs to go. But, it, and Wes, I guess I'll start with you. I mean, what, what do you think is the most significant sort of change, challenge for journalists over the past year? I mean, we've made some references to the new administration and the tone, but when you're out there doing your work, I mean, what has really changed or what, what do you face that, that feels different now? So I'd stretch it. I'd stretch it even a little further than the last year. Um, but but I would say kind of this era. Whether it's you know in my experience, for example, my experience covering Baltimore or Ferguson is not much dissim not very dissimilar to my experiences the last year or two. At times when I would help out on the trail or when I was here for my colleagues who were this reporting, right? Uh, uh, this physical animosity, I think, is something that's different. Mm. Um, the I, I think that. You know, I talked to my friends and colleagues who were on the campaign trail and the physical threats they were receiving and the physical concerns. Um, I, I know it's something we've talked about internally a lot at the Post, uh, having a large number of prominent correspondents. And I know every major news organization is having these same conversations. W what does this look like? You know, e even, again, for me, as someone who's always covered things that are relatively controversial and people are, the people in my inbox are not always the happiest with me or in general. Um, this last six months, I think I've gotten far more death threats than I'd gotten the last four years combined, right? And, and we're talking about things that we're taking to the police and filling out reports about. That, that there's been a, an anger again, that I think has existed uh, and I think was there. And I don't know that it's necessarily a one year uh, track back to, but, but that I think is being expressed in ways that uh, we had not been seeing five years ago or six years ago. That does make this job harder. It, it makes it harder because I think that on a few different levels. First, that you're spending time in meetings with security consultants that isn't time spent making phone calls. Uh, second is that, you know, the job, these jobs very often are about going into places that may be a, a little unsettled, maybe tough or, or difficult or potentially dangerous, and, and it adds an additional potential pause as you're getting ready to do that. Um, and that can mean sometimes you don't ask a question you wish you were asking or were not. I think it's also difficult as well because when we're under, when you feel under attack, when you are under attack, it forces you to have to consciously not become defensive. Right? If, if I'm getting sent to a place and I'm trying to write a story and the folks who I'm interacting with don't like the media, don't like our coverage, are upset about something we wrote last, last week, it, it adds a layer of interaction that I've now got to have with them to make sure that, that I'm hearing them in good faith, right? Because, because they may see me as an enemy, but this person is still a reader or a subject or, of a story. There's still, there's still someone who I need to deal with in a way that is fair. Right, and I think that that can become difficult as well. You know, like I said, I, I'm fortunate to work at a place where um, 
I've got really talented professional colleagues who do that really well. I'm also fortunate that I don't have to cover politics day in and day out. I don't know that I'd have the temperament in this environment to do that. Um, but, but I do think that it adds some real difficulty. I mean, I, w I would just echo that a little bit. I mean, I uh, have been through a, a bunch of campaigns, and I do think that this is an extraordinary and unusual moment in terms of the ferocity of the animosity and the intensity of it. I mean, I've had reporters uh, who, uh, they, they've been threatened with rape, uh, with murder. Uh, they've received anti-Semitic uh, material sent to their houses. Um, and I do think that um, when I think a little bit about the Trump era and uh, what's so unusual about him, um, obviously he emerged from the reality television world, but he also mastered and emerged from the social media world. And there is a passion and a fervency to his followers uh, that can take on a real violent tone. And it's something that uh, when I sat down, I was putting together the team of reporters who were going to cover the 2016 races back in 2015. And uh, our senior reporters thought it would be uh, Bush versus Clinton, and they were trying to keep their eyes open. And, uh, you know, I really wish that I had had an opportunity to warn people because it can be quite um, discouraging. Um, I think that there's a way that this um, experience was very personal. Um, I remember there was a reporter, quite a good investigative reporter on my team who wrote a story uh, before the Access Hollywood tape came out um, about Trump's treatment of women. And uh, if you recall, um, when he finally had his second presidential debate with Hillary Clinton, he was asked directly whether he had ever assaulted women or kissed them, you know, unwelcome kisses, and he said no. And it turned out that a few women who were watching the show had experienced those kinds of assaults and told us that story. So the reporter wrote that story and uh, she went to get response from the Trump campaign. And ordinarily when you are a political reporter, investigative reporter, you go to a campaign and there's a process for how they respond. And you go over the facts and they fight back and they try to get things out of, out of the story. And uh, it's adversarial, but there is kind of a protocol. Now with Trump, it was a deeply personal experience. And what they would do is put him on the line and he could be quite seductive, but he could also be, you know, fairly, um, let's say, animated. So um, <laughs> he started talking to her and uh, denying these claims, saying it was just locker room talk and started to yell at her. And he ultimately said, you're a disgusting human being. And so we put that in the story. And, um, <laughs> you know, on the internet, uh, you know, it was sort of a signal to his followers how to regard this woman who had written the story. You know, does she have value? Does the press have value? And it was sort of a signal of how, uh, how he saw her. And um, it's, it's touched off this really interesting debate, or at least a discussion at, our, at the Times, because um, one uh, reality right now for reporters is that we're supposed to be quite public and active on social media, and we're supposed to be on all platforms and interacting with readers. Uh, but I had two investigative reporters go out on a tough story about Trump. One was very active on social media, one was almost invisible, and the one who was active found himself like he's gay and his husband started getting attacked. They looked up, you know, the price that he paid for his house and started going after him for that. And she was so invisible that the, the only thing that they could come up to attack her were they, Bill O'Reilly ended up calling her a uh, feminist. Which is a, <laughs> but they didn't really have anything else. So, um, but anyway, um, to what degree should we be accessible to the public? I tend to believe that it, you know, it's part of our duty to be out there, but it also makes you a, a personal target in a lot of interesting ways. So for, for you and Wesley, and then I'm going to want you to weigh in, Brooke, th this, this, let's just call it banter with the president, um, at, at times gets extremely personal. And, um, you know, I'm working for the failing New York Times, for example. Uh, <laughs> and I forget how he refers to the Post exactly. Oh, we're the, I think we're the Amazon Washington Post. Yeah, it's like right, right, right. Shit, okay. <laughs> um, But what is that like, Wes? I mean, when, when you guys know you've got... I mean, we, I think we all get that the story comes out and it's denied, denied, then absolutely confirmed three days later or something. But, but, but I mean, what's it like when 
the most powerful man in the world attacks one of your, one of the people you sit next to in the in the newsroom. Well, so so I think I I delineate I would delineate two different things, right? The attacks on individuals and the attacks on the organizations of individuals, right? The first time he tweets, we used to be the failing Washington Post, and we've upgraded. He figured out who owned us, and now he, and his attack got more complex than it was previously. <laughs> but prior to that, the we were the failing Washington Post, much like they are the failing New York Times. And initially, that was kind of shocking. This wasn't, we should have known better even then, but there was still this idea that as a presidential candidate, he, there, he would be holding some level of decorum about it, his talk. And in a world in which, you can't imagine a world in which a Mitt Romney or a George W. Bush or a Hillary Clinton would say something like this about a New York Times and a Washington Post. Um, not that they all love you mean often, publicly publicly no correct <laughs> on, on Twitter I, I can assure you they've probably all said worse things um, that, that said um, initially, initially it was a little shocking uh, the institutional attacks I think eventually became almost uh, points to be rallied around in rallying cries, right? If, if the President of the United, if this President of the United States, and at the time that candidate was not attacking you, there was a real question of were you doing the journalism you needed to be doing on this campaign. Democracy um, dies in darkness, correct. anyone? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, but, uh, but I will say, though, uh, you know, as I was listening to Carolyn's examples and some others I was thinking of, I mean, it is horrifying to watch individuals, people you know, your friends, your colleagues, uh, go through when it's not this broad brush about the whole organization, but when it's about a particular story, a particular person. This person is fake news. This person is, a, you know, a liar. They're making, disgusting. They're making stuff up. You see how there are, again, these are, these are real people living real lives who are now being de deluged with threats with attacks, with people looking up everything you could ever find on, you know, I had to call my parents and, you know, make sure they were on alert because someone had published a bunch of, like, parking tickets I'd gotten in college and it was my parents' home address and so now I'm worried that these people from the internet are going to show up at my parents' house thinking it's my house, right? That these are real, you know, uh, colleagues who have been, who, who've had to, I mean, I've had to sit in some of these meetings, but colleagues who've been told that they should, you know, build a bunker in their basement in case that guy from the internet shows up at their house. So do, do you have enough rations for a week just in case they I mean, these are real conversations happening in newsrooms um, because, yeah, when someone on the internet tells you that they got a gun and they're showing up at your house, you, you don't want to have to do an after-action report on that. You, have to, you, have to, you don't know who this guy is or what's going on. And so it, it certainly can be disconcerting and, and scary in a real way. You know? I, I do have to add, uh, I agree on every point that you made, but it, it's complicated. It is psychologically complicated because Donald Trump uh, is obsessed with the New York Times. And, um, you know, I, I started uh, uh, building the campaign, presidential campaign team, and I had an office, and there were about 20 reporters who sat around my office, sort of in a row. And I have to tell you, in the early days of the campaign, I couldn't walk down that row without at least one person being on the phone with Donald Trump. He was outrageously accessible to them. I mean, yeah. the lowliest summer intern would be having a lengthy <laughs> conversation. And uh, like I said, he can be quite seductive. And so you are an intern at the New York Times. Oh my goodness, like, you know, he can be quite flattering. And um, I remember when he came, uh, just after he became uh, president, he was president-elect, and we had him come in and meet with the editors and reporters at the Times. And you really had the sense of a guy, an outer borough, New York guy, who was craving the approval of the establishment of the New York Times and of what it represented to him as a Queens kid. And I remember sitting there, there were probably about 20 of us around a table, and he came in and he sat there with his arms crossed, like very insecure, and he just started reciting, you can entirely imagine this if you've seen him in a rally, he just started reciting the tallies in all the states that he won, and you could see like his own confidence kind of growing. And so uh, he's hostile, and he's challenging, and he's difficult, and he's made us rethink how we cover him, but he's also, um, you know, there's a, there's a crazy accessibility to him mm -hmm. that is puzzling. I mean, I had a, a reporter, great reporter, covered Hillary Clinton for two years, she got one interview during two years for 10 minutes on the telephone. It was about Hillary Clinton's plans for the summer, I think. Like, she was going to read 
the book by, who's that swimmer who uh, went across the Cuba? Um, Diana Nyad. So, um, you know, Donald Trump has done, I don't know how many sit down interviews with us, with the Post. It's a whole different, it is psychologically complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, Brooke, I mean, help us step back and, you know, get out of necessarily politics or, you know, all of this. And, and I mean, how are these guys doing? And I mean these guys, I mean the national media and their coverage of the president and, and how it all comes across because it, it matters. I mean, it matters a great deal. I mean, it's a work in progress because, look, a lot of people, a lot of the things that I hear when I speak in public and people have problems with the press, I mean, the last I looked, the press was third uh, from the bottom of American institutions and people's esteem. I think the bottom was Congress, then was big business, then media, and then 20, if you go, you know, 20 steps up to the top, it was the military and small business, which is kind of interesting. Where were used car sounds? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so, and a lot of people have uh, the entirely wrong idea that uh, there is a conspiracy in the media. You know, if there isn't a conspiracy, I mean, media want to stay. They don't want to get too far ahead of the public. They don't want to get too far behind. And, uh, you know, and they've been working under rules that were forged in the middle of the last century having to do, for a variety of reasons, is when the style, the pre prevailing style of journalism became objectivity. It was, uh, it was a style. I'm not talking about fairness. I'm not talking about accuracy. I'm talking about a kind of disengagement like, you know, journalists are the order, in some order of passionless priests or, or cyborg computers or something like that. And uh, the fact is, is that you remove yourself from the equation, you remove so much of what you can do to enrich your reporting. I mean, when I was writing the the, the other book that's out there is uh, the influencing. Got the plug machine. of the book in. Good no, work. Just, no, not not that one, <laughs> but the old one. You know, I did. Uh, I I looked into uh, the objective coverage of slavery, uh, and the objective coverage of Japanese internment, and in the end, you realize that. What if you want to be truly accurate and fair, you can't pretend you don't have values and principles and knowledge and, you know, historical context and all of those things. And so I think that to a great degree, President Trump, by breaking all the rules of civility that have enabled the press to do its job fairly well, and, and to talk with the, uh, the government in an, uh, in an official way in which there's a huge reliance on anonymous sources that tell you nothing, and you trade for those bland quotes a certain amount of candor so, with your readers so that you can complete your story. This is, this is kind of a, of a deal. Well, all those deals are off, and I think it's liberating. I think it makes the media more responsive to the needs of their listeners, and I think it makes the reporting fairer and more accurate and more important than the kind of false balance that often prevailed in the past. So I think that's great. I also think, quite interestingly, that the backlash to the continuous attacks on the media are, is a growing awareness on the part of the public that, yeah, you, if you want information that is of high quality, you, you do have to pay for it. I mean... Wait, we gotta have a round of applause on that one. <laughs> it's, it's often called in the business, I, I don't know if you guys have heard it, but you know, the original sin for journalism is when it made all its stuff free online. And then they couldn't put the toothpaste back in the tube there. They, you know, they thought that, you know, somehow uh, there would be enough online advertising and, you know, they didn't anticipate 
Craigslist essentially taking away a huge slice of regular newspaper income. And, uh, and we got increasingly reliant on advertising, basically selling our audience to advertisers rather than selling our material to the reader. That's not saying the material wasn't good even when the reliance was on advertisers, but you know, they wanted more people to read it, made it very cheap, got the advertisers to subsidize, now it falls back on the readers. And uh, supporting good journalism has become, because of Trump, a political act, a form of political engagement. And I think that, you know, that's a long time coming. Uh, maybe it wasn't owed the media before, but the media are, you know, uh, there's a sense among many people that, you know, even if they never leave Washington, they're war reporters. <laughs> because <laughs> not, just, uh, not just because of the physical threats that they may endure, but because there's a sense that uh, the stakes are so high. And uh, the old rules that kept the game tame uh, are, uh, are no longer on the table. So it's kind of a jungle out there. So one of the, we've been talking a lot about national stuff. So I have this question for you, Brooke, as the editor of a, a regional newspaper. Um, sometimes I get this sense that uh, it's not unlike Congress. People hate Congress, but they love their congressmen. You know? So people may hate the national media, but do they love their local media? Or what is your, your sense of, of, of that? Well, they certainly love their media in, in times of great distress, like, you know, the Houston Chronicle you were talking about. Certainly the Times-Picayune, which had a very mixed relationship with a large part of its public, especially uh, the black population. You know, they, they were there in force. They were, you know, they were providing information that no one else was providing. And, uh, you know, they heard over and over again, you know, I never liked you guys, but, you know, now I, I see what the, what the value is. Now, the, the question is, is can you maintain that feeling of, can you maintain that loyalty and uh, the belief in your value when you're not doing a life and death but relatively easy story to tell like a storm? Uh, when you get into the complexities of the storm, as I mentioned before, or when you're talking about politics or, or any of the other issues on the ground that local papers do, I mean, they should love their local paper. And we did uh, a piece a while back we called Dead Beats, on beats that have just gone away. And the scariest one is the State House. The lack of state house reporting. This is shown have, in study after. We have 12 after, people committed well, to the that state is, house. And, and I, have to, <laughs> I have to say that, you know, I'm so glad you're saying that because that is vanishingly rare in this country now. When the state house is covered, it's usually a journalism student that's doing it for a class. They don't have the history there. There's, there could be graft happening right out in a public uh, meeting and nobody is reporting on it. And it's happened over and over again around the country. I don't know how you generate that kind of love. You're, the question you're asking me, you're in a much better position to answer than I am. I mean, do, do the citizens of Atlanta, or a sufficient number of them, love what you do? A newspaper's going to piss off a large part ask. of the audience. <laughs> if you... If you have 12 people in the state house, then they should love you okay. because you are protecting them from untold amount of, of harm and just uh, civil, civil corruption. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take us in a little bit different direction and kind of put us on the ground and on the front lines of reporting. And I'm going to read a sentence that is my favorite one from uh, your book, Wes, which is this. You don't know what it is. I wrote a good sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Much of my job as a reporter consists of desperate and more often than not failed attempts to convince people with no reason to trust me that this is exactly what they should do. Mm. I think that I think also in that 
somewhere in that paragraph, uh, <laughs> I, I talked about, and I, I want to say this was not the LA Times, an editor or a friend, a colleague, someone mentioned that, you know, very often as a reporter, you're showing up in someone's life on what's either the best day of their life or the worst day of their life. You're interviewing them because they just got named CEO or because their son just died in a car accident, right? That these, these are the doors we knock on. Um, and, and that because of that, there's this negotiation of how you interact with people knowing that by telling their story, telling their story is perhaps the only way you can help society at large, your readers, understand the world we live in and what is going on. And you've done a lot of that. I mean, talk about it, you know, in that two years of, from Ferguson to the, to the book being published, some of those moments or what you think is... is and so I think, it all, and I think I'm going to cop out and use the example that I think is where that section of the book is, which is uh, when Walter Scott was killed. Now, Walter Scott was a police shooting in North Charleston, South Carolina. Um, he had been pulled over in a traffic stop, um, but because he had some outstanding child support, uh, he knew that he was going to get arrested and have to spend a night in jail. Now, he had just, he had previously had to spend a night in jail for this and had lost his job for that. And he knew that here, here he was, if, if, he gets pulled, if, if he gets arrested, he's going to lose his job again, further keeping him from paying off the, the, the outstanding fines. And so in that moment, he ran. Uh, the officer, Michael Slager, gave chase. They ended up in this, um, you know, they end up in this field about half a block away. Um, Captured in video. Yeah. yeah. And so at the time, um, and the excellent newspaper there, the Post and Courier. But at the time, at the day of the police shooting, unless it was a Friday or Saturday, the version Officer Slager gave was that they'd gotten in a struggle. Walter Scott, or Walter Scott had gotten a hold of his taser, was standing over him, was about to tase the officer to death, and he did what he had to do. He, he pulled his gun and shot him. What the officer didn't know, and in fact, I, I bring that up because in that first article on the first day, the officer's attorney is quoted as saying, Michael Slager is the exact type of police officer I want out there. I'm so glad he was there, and I'm so glad he did what he had to do. Unbeknownst to Michael Slager, or his attorney, was that there had been this man, Fernandez Santana, who had seen this interaction, pulled his cell phone out, and started recording it. And what that video showed was, was not that Walter Scott had taken Michael Slager's taser, but rather that they, they certainly were struggling, and Walter Scott ran away. And, and as he was running, and which it, it can barely even be described as running, he was really hobbling away, Michael Slager pulled his gun and fired five to six shots into Walter Scott's back, uh, a shooting that clearly, by most societal standards, amounted to a murder. The, as I went down there, I remember I really didn't want to go on this one. This was an interesting, I don't want to say interesting, but this was a tough shooting for a lot of reasons. This was the quote-unquote perfect victim shooting in many ways, right? You had had, this was a case in which you had a man clearly captured on video, an unarmed black man, shot in the back as he ran away. Not a question of whether he was fighting the officer at a time, not a question of if he was reaching for a gun. You could watch with your eyes and see that he was not. Um, this was also a case that, that um, in this case particularly, I, had, I knew this video was coming. Our friends at the Times were the first to publish it. Um, but I, from one of their sources, knew that, I, that this was about to be published. Uh, and so because of that, I had this rare moment of you know, these names that go viral, these hashtags. It seems that they intrude upon our days suddenly. You're at lunch, and all of a sudden, the whole world is talking about a shooting somewhere. And this was a case where I had six hours of knowing the next name that was going to go viral. I knew Walter Scott's name before the video. I knew that this was the man who'd been killed. I'm looking at his Facebook page before it's been taken down. I'm seeing where his family lives. And, and it was tough. When I flew out to North Charleston, so we got through the first day, the video published, we, wrote, we, we covered the story, and I got out there, and I, it must have been the first or second day, and it was um, at the house where Walter Scott's mother lived and his, and his siblings. He'd grown up in this house. And it was myself and a colleague at the Times and a colleague at the LA Times. And we got ourselves invited in to this home. And Walter Scott... How did you manage that? 
very awkwardly um, is, I mean, is the honest to God truth. I actually think most people who allow me to interview them feel bad for me and want me to stop talking. And so <laughs> they say, if you'll shut up, come, we, I can start talking. <laughs> and, you know, because because you're standing there. You know, here we are. You know, you've flown across the country to cover this man's death and to cover protests that have spurred in, in result in result of it. And now you're standing in front of his mother. And what do you have to say to her? You know, very often, especially because because of the way cable drives a lot of our coverage, you, you get a lot of relatively vapid questions, right? I, I, don't, I, I don't feel comfortable walking up to a woman who's just lost her son and saying, what does justice look like for you in this case, mm, right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't, I don't really care what the soundbite about whether or not she thinks the protest should be peaceful or not. This woman has just lost her son, right? And I, and I imagine, I think about what would happen if myself or one of my brothers were killed and now my colleagues were showing up at our home and asking these questions. How, what would that, but so very often, we, you, you know, we, we try to just talk about the person who was lost. What do you remember? What do you think about? How do you, uh, you know, as, as you're thinking about your son or your daughter, and in most cases, these parents are talking about them in the present tense because they have not, they, they don't even understand yet that this person is gone. Walter does this, he, as opposed to he did. I, there's a surreal moment, though. So we're, we're talking to his mother, and she invites us in, and we're sitting down in, in their couch, and it's a home that looked a lot like my grandparents' house. Every wall was covered with a photo of someone and a certificate, or a, you know, it, and it almost felt like a holiday because people had been bringing food. Um, and so the whole family's there. There's food everywhere. There are photos. And we're sitting and we're watching that young man, Ferdinand Santana, um, or Fendon Santana, I'm sorry, who had recorded the video, had not done an interview yet. He was still relatively anonymous, and he was about to do his first interview to talk about how he had gotten this video and why he turned it over to the family. And the interview was being conducted by Lester Holt um, of NBC on the family's front lawn, and I watched with Walter Scott's family on their television in their living room, a man being interviewed on their front lawn 50 feet away, and they are hearing for the first time this story about this, this man who has, in many ways, changed their life almost as much as the officer who killed their son has. That they now have some semblance of hope for justice that had not existed otherwise or would not have. And it was just one of these moments where you're, you're inside it. You're here watching this family watch the news to find out what happened to their son or their brother or their uncle. And, and it was... Like I said, it's something I think about a lot in, in terms of the humanity of, you know, we sometimes can be harsh, especially on the internet, with every word used, every phrase. You, is the family, are they doing this the right way? Should they be have, raising money? Should, shouldn't they be condemning violence? And we forget sometimes that this is a family that's grieving, you know, and what cut through that and reminded me of that was the interview ended, and they turned the TV off and went to the car because they had to go look at burial plots. Right? For, that, for, for us, this was the story of the moment in the nation. And for them, this was the worst day of their year. And I just thought that was, like I said, that's, that's still an interview and a trip that I think about a lot. You know, back in the days before the internet, <laughs> there was uh, a great crime reporter in Florida named Edna Buchanan. And uh, back in the 80s, one year in Florida, uh, there was a huge amount of homicide, a lot of murder, and she decided that attention should be paid and that she would, she told me this story, that she would um, report on every murder that took place in Florida that year. And we're talking about, these are numbers that we haven't seen in cities, American cities, in a very long time. And uh, she went on vacation and then she went to go report on the murders that she'd missed. And she went to someone's house and rang the bell and an elderly woman answered the door and she said, I'm here to talk about your grands. I'm Edna Buchanan from, I can't remember what paper she Miami worked Herald. My, yeah. Uh, I'm here to talk about your grandson. And the woman looked at her, pulled the door back, opened the way and said, I wondered why you didn't come. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, 
there's a way, there's a right way to do this. The bummer beat, that's what some, someone once called it. Uh, you know, a lot of it depends on the picture you use. It always has, and now especially, because we've seen, you know, if I were, you know, if, if, if I, you know, just, you could show Michael Brown in uniform, or you could show him doing a fun rap thing, or you could show someone looking sexy on her cell phone, or, you know, looking, I mean, uh, we all have a million faces, and uh, you get tired with that Trayvon Martin right at the beginning, you saw that. And, uh, you know, so you, you pick the picture that the family wants. Uh, unless, you know, they, you get a picture that's engaged in, I mean, if a person has died, you know, people want the per their loss to be, especially a loss like this, to be acknowledged by the world. The trouble is it's so much harder to, it, it, it's good that we're noticing more of these deaths and these murders. Uh, the frustration is that we aren't seeing enough justice. Carolyn, I mean, Wes talked a little bit about, you know, the going into these difficult reporting situations and of all kinds, and, and we're going to get him to talk a little bit about what it was like to be on the ground in Ferguson, but as a person who makes decisions about the situations you put reporters in from political coverage to the other things you've done to your career, I mean, what... What do you tell them? What do you, what do you think about before you send a bunch of people to a place like you know, Houston or, or, or into the presidential campaign or you know, anything in between? I mean, usually as an editor, uh, what you find yourself doing is trying to find ways to um, let them know that it's okay. Uh, the instinct of reporters is always to go, and there's sort of an intrepidness that's so intrinsic to a reporter's spirit. Uh, you know, even during the, um, the flood in Houston, I was really worried. There were two reporters who were making their way back into Houston just at the beginning of the storm, mm. um, and they were in a rental car, and the floods were so bad they had to abandon the car. And um, I know these reporters pretty well, and, you know, one of them was walking on the side of the interstate. And um, a lot of what you have to do as an editor is to give people permission not to go sometimes or to tell them, you know, that just to reinforce that safety is important. Uh, because I do think that it's part of what drives us as journalists is to be there. Um, you know, we've had some uh, tragedies abroad uh, where people take risks and um, it's because they're driven to bring back that story. Um, but a lot of what you have to do as an editor is to give people permission and to be the person who is sometimes imposing the restraint uh, because it doesn't come naturally, especially to younger reporters. I mean, have there been times when you've had to do that and say, look, you're just not going or um, I'm, we're not going to put you in that position? And oh, absolutely, yeah, for all of us. And, you know, sometimes we've been defied. You know, some reporters have gone places where we didn't think it was a good idea or we'd advised otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sure. So speaking of a place that uh, was not maybe welcoming or safe or you were in harm's way, Wesley, talk about Ferguson and your experience sure. there. You know, and I, I think that that, and that, and that really resonates, uh, well, Carolyn says resonates with me as well because it you know, I've even in this last week have had a lot of conversations with my colleagues who, I've been one of our point people in D.C. for a lot of it, catching the feeds from people who are, have been in Houston or in Louisiana and elsewhere, coordinating with it. And we've got a pretty small, tight-knit group of national correspondents. We know each other very, very well um, and turn to each other kind of for advice very often in these moments. And, and it's been those conversations, and many of the folks who are on our, our national correspondents are former foreign correspondents for us, right? And so telling our former Cairo bureau chief, no, go to bed, don't pull an all-nighter on this stupid, like, you know, like, having those conversations. No, we don't need that from you right now. Like, I'm, I'm the one writing the story, and I'm telling you, if you stay up all night, I'm not going to use it. Go to bed. You know, having those back and forth with each other, and they do that to me all the time when I'm out wherever it is, right? Well, I can do that. No, 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 no. Go to sleep. The story's already written. Go to, go to sleep, right? Um, because a lot of it is about making decisions that, one, are going to keep you safe and healthy, but also that, so that in the morning you haven't stayed up all night and you can actually be useful at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. You know, this was something that I, I picked up. I learned a little bit from doing a lot of this kind of protest reporting in a relatively 
pressure cooker period of mm -hmm. time, right? Was that, you know, Ferguson, Missouri, for example, was three months of continuous protest. Three months of hundreds of people in the street every single night. In the beginning, there was this insatiable uh, like, attention and need for live updates at all times about what's happening. Are they on this street? Are they on this street? What's happening? What's going on? It was, there was live, a lot of live streaming was happening. There was a lot of this feeling that everyone wanted to be there at all times. Now, as a reporter on the ground, that can be both, you know, for me as someone who is kind of social media oriented, could be a could be a great way to kind of build an audience and it's something I could do very easily, but also became frustrating both for me and even for some of my bosses because when you're spending your entire time documenting every moment in real time, you're spending <laughs> none of your time taking a step back and thinking, what happened over the course of the entire night? What's going on at 10,000 feet or 100,000 feet? Because you're focused on the new person who just showed up with a new sign and interviewing. You know, and so there was this feeling of having to kind of step back a little bit. What was also interesting in that um, or frustrating or difficult about Ferguson was that it was, you know, a, this was a case where you had masses of people uh, protesting and demonstrating, and then on top of that, folks who kind of came in to spec spectate. If you've got 100 mm -hmm. people in the street, you've got 200 people watching the 100 people in the street. Half of them are us, half of them are just the guy who walked outside and said, what's going on? Um, and, you, and this was all happening in a sub small suburb of St. Louis that um, I'd never heard of the day before Michael Brown had been killed, um, where the authorities weren't, will, will tell you themselves, were not particularly prepared for thousands of people in the street at all times, didn't know what to do, didn't know how to deal with this. You had times where it, you would go from in one moment a church group singing We Shall Overcome in the Street to everyone being tear gassed moments later because things would just change so quickly. Uh, because of that, uh, and I think this is actually that experience, and I, myself and a colleague at the Huffington Post were famously arrested covering Ferguson. Mm -hmm. We were a, among dozens of reporters who at some point or another were taken into custody or detained um, because there were largely indiscriminate arrest happening of, of folks. Um, there was a, and it was just so chaotic. An example I always use was there was a period of time for a week or two this happened about a week into the Ferguson protest, where the police announced what they call the five-second rule. And the five-second rule was that you, if you, you could, everyone could come and protest and do whatever you wanted, but you had to be in continual motion. And if you stopped walking for five <laughs> seconds, you were subject to arrest. Now, at the time, all of us who'd been here in this chaos were like, well, that seems kind of reasonable. Okay, whatever. And in hindsight, that's absurd. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you, can't t you can't tell me I have to keep walking on the side. But, you know, like, literally, people couldn't set up like, stands to hand out water because they were getting arrested. People had shown up, the local NAACP had shown up to do a voter registration drive. They're thinking, there are 4,000 people in the street. Let's show up and go. And they got arrested because they, were, because they stopped walking for more than five seconds. Now, all of these arrests ended up getting thrown out because the ACLU came in and sued them, rightfully. But it was that disorienting that all of us reporter First Amendment types were like, oh, I guess it makes sense we have to walk around all like, We didn't even put up a fight about this. The, the lesson, uh, to tie that all together, I think one of the lessons from, you know, like I said, I spent a lot of time in Ferguson, spent some time in plenty of other cities, Charleston, Cleveland, Milwaukee, um, Minneapolis, Baltimore, New York, um, was that, you know, when I cover these demonstrations now, one of the things, I, I try to be very deliberate about my coverage. I think sometimes when there's a ton of things going on, it's easy to get lost in the noise of what's happening and walk away without actually having your hands wrapped around anything firm. Um, and so, you know, in part, I, one of the, those things means that I don't, if that street corner is getting tear gassed, I actually probably don't need to be standing on that street corner. It's probably preferable if I'm standing at the street corner across the street. Because then I can see what happened and tell you what happened. <laughs> it's not particularly useful to my readers if I can't see, and I'm, nor can I breathe. And How am I going to document what time it was when the tear gas started getting fired? I didn't see it. Yeah. And, and so, there, so there's something to be said for, you know, if my, my job is to decipher and to translate an experience to paint you a picture about what happened. And the better perspective I have, the better the picture I'm gonna be able to paint you. And so that's something I try to think about. And so because of that, um, I, I tend to not have as physically miserable experiences covering protests anymore because again, I no longer feel like I've gotta be right there. You know, if, if they're gonna march in a circle till 7 a.m., well, if something crazy happens, someone's gonna let me know. I can, I can go sit on the bench for half an hour and, and recharge my phone. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's this thought that, you know, sometimes 
in the moment, removing yourself over the long run is helpful. Uh, one thing, I'm going to have a couple more questions up here, but we're going to let you ask questions. We've got a microphone at the front of either aisle, so if you want to ask a question of any, any of the, uh, the panelists, just go ahead and start lining up with the microphone so we can go right to that after uh, a couple more questions that I have. Um, and this is for whoever wants to go first, but I'd like all three of you to take a shot at it. Um, what do you think it's most important for the general public to understand about journalists and what we do and what we must do now? Not a trick question. I mean, it's like, you know. Um, I think the public needs to understand that this is very difficult work, uh, that we're trying to get it right, uh, that we um, feel obliged to acknowledge when we don't, um, that it's expensive work, um, hence the desire to have people pay for it, um, and that there are a lot of uh, difficult stresses on our industry right now um, that make reporting at all levels very difficult. I mean, we haven't had time to talk about uh, the platforms that really dominate us now, Google and Facebook, and how they've reshaped the media, and in a lot of ways, disempowered the media and taken control of a lot of the decisions about what kinds of stories um, get attention and get publicity. Um, but, you know, I um, have been privileged to know hundreds, thousands of journalists, and they are people of uh, integrity, and uh, they are people who are not making a lot of money, and they are people who are determined uh, to get stories that are meaningful and enriching for readers. And um, I do think that it's easy sometimes to stereotype or uh, caricature what we do, and um, sometimes we provide the ammunition for that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but this is very difficult work, it's very important work. I do think uh, post-election that there's been some response from the public that suggests that they see that. Um, we've certainly seen that in terms of our subscriptions. Um, I think we're up a half million, um, including a lot of young people. You know, uh, one of the most reassuring things for me recently is hanging out with young people, non-journalists, in their 20s, and the way they're responding to journalism uh, in this moment is quite um, heartening uh, and kind of exhilarating. So that's what I would say. What? You know, I'd briefly just say I think that you know, journalists are people. We're real people. You know, I think that that, and that's and that's true. Look, and that's true of the, our most prominent colleagues. Anderson Cooper is just a guy. Don Lemon is just a guy. Wolf Blitzer is just a guy, right? Um, they and and the, and the colleagues who aren't as well known, right? And I think that that is important, especially in these times where things are so charged, when passions run so heavily. Um, that, that I think, or I think, it's just important to remember that these are not disembodied voices and names. Uh, that that most of us are reading most, if not all, of our mail. Um, and most, if not all, of our email, and I'm reading every Twitter mention and every, you know, and that, and I, and there are people who I'm, who I'm like, wait, you really think that about me? That was, I mean, I, maybe I got that thing wrong, but that's really me. Like, what do you, think? <laughs> you know, that the, the, it, it, that, and look, the reality is, you know, I, I certainly am, and many of our colleagues, we are certainly public figures. I, I think, in fact, I think a lot of the scrutiny is a good thing. I, I think it's important for us to remember that that we serve uh, the public, and I think it's also important for us to remember that it's not our job to be liked or beloved. It's our job to be right. Um, and there are plenty of stories that you could cover throughout history that covering it accurately would have meant being hated by most of the population. Um, but history would probably give you some credit. Um, and so that's something I try to think about, especially as we cover stories that perhaps are about institutional inequities or injustices or, you know, is this going to be right and be proven right over time? And if that's the case, I'll take some mean email. It'll be okay. But like I said, I think the big thing about us is that we want to get these things right, and we are humans who beat ourselves up even more so than, than the public does when we don't get those things right. Uh, well, I guess I would say that uh, in this moment, and has been for quite some time now, you guys have as much as re responsibility for uh, what's out there as, as we do. 
Um, one thing that Walter Lippmann said in, uh, in the 20s uh, is that there's an essential lack of logic in uh, the mission of journalism, in that the founders intended it to be a, a public service, like a, like a hospital or, or a school. Um, but it's structured as a business. And so you have a mission wrapped in a business. Um, we're selling information. Even public radio is selling information. Um, the reason why if Trump didn't get all those viewers, then CNN wouldn't have left the camera focused on his podium, empty podium during the campaign, waiting for him to show up, rather than the speech that Hillary uh, Clinton was at that moment giving. Uh, an empty Trump podium was a bigger draw than a Hillary Clinton speech. Well, uh, then you decide, well, there's the big argument. Who, are, are you an elitist or are you going to give the public what they want? So there's, there's that and then uh, you have to give the public what they want because you're a business. So we end up, uh, those of us who are doing the best job may not have the biggest audience because people consume information for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is entertainment. So I'm just saying that uh, you can make the media better by how you consume it. Well, why don't we start over at this microphone and then we'll alternate, okay? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, is one of the issues in journalism today uh, that we spend a lot of time on the sensationalism of the event uh, in, at the expense of making what led to the event compelling to a mass audience? I don't think it's an either or. Um, you have to cover the event. People want to know about the event. There are ways to cover the event that might be less sensational. Um, sensational means exaggerated, right? Because some stories are just naturally and truthfully amazing or horrifying or full of sensation. So I assume you mean over, over hyping parts, right? Because uh, you, you, people want to see the pictures of the flood. They also need those other stories. And uh, it's great if you can have them come close together while the public's attention is riveted on the drama. But it's not, uh, it's not that one is costing the other, is, is happening at the expense of the other. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying, if you, if you look at one um, point, such as a person getting murdered, by its very nature it's sensational because looking at that one uh, information right. point. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say any event that we're choosing to cover is sensational just by its nature. I, no, I, get that, yeah, I get this kind of question yeah. a lot and it's a really good one. Um, and sometimes I'll answer it this way. I'm, I'm afraid it might sound a little flip, but let me give it a try. We devoted the AJC, a, as do virtually all media organizations, a lot of re our resources to covering education. And our reporters have goals, I mean, for the number of stories they produce, for how much audience they get online, you know. And, and they, they, I am very proud of what our education reporters do, and they have created an awareness in our state of education issues that I think is important. But I can tell you, when you look at the audience that we get, say, online or through Facebook, when they're trying to reach their audience goals, they're way better off with a story about a teacher having sex with a student than they are about education policy. That has nothing to do with decisions we're making in the newsroom. It's an entirely the decision that the audience makes about what they're interested in. It's a constant balancing act. I'm not rationalizing sensationalism or, or complaining about be, doing more thoughtful journalism, but Brooke's right. The audience has a lot to say about what we do. So. Well, and I, I think I'll just add really briefly, and I, but I do think there's also a good, um, I think it's important for us to remember, and I think we, I think many places we do do this, is that 
at what point do we step back and do the story about how many teachers have had sex with students right. in this state in the last, and is there some type of stru structural breakdown? You guys did a gr great example of this was last year um, with the piece about doctors, uh, the series about doctors being accused of sexually assaulting or abusing. <laughs> the, um, it, we, we, um, we often, would come, you know, I have a Metro newspaper background, and, or even with my cover, with the police shootings, right? Well, we cover one of them. This story is compelling or interesting, but at what point do we say, all right, let's step back. How often is this thing occurring? How often does it happen? Who's supposed to be preventing it from happening? What are the best practices here? How does this work? And I, and I think it's important, again, now that takes resource, that takes time. It takes me not writing about every police shooting that day to spend time writing about one for six months or about, and, and that's difficult, especially in the environment we work in. You know, I'm blessed to work at a place right now where we've got a lot of resources, but I know most of my colleagues across the country don't have the privilege to disappear for six months to work on one thing. Uh, and, and so th that certainly, I think, is the balancing act as well. Um, I, I think that there are, though, all of us, who, we all work in newsrooms that understand that it's not just about the, the headline often, it's about explaining that headline in the context of the world. I think we're going to go to another question. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm here with my dad tonight who introduced me to On the Media probably seven or eight years ago. <laughs> so I want to start off by... When you were five? When I was, <laughs> four, I was four at the time. Uh, and I just want to say thank you, Brooke. You're a personal hero of mine, and I think On the Media is the most Im important piece of journalism that I encounter on a weekly basis. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. But I have a specific question for you. For all of you, I'd be curious to hear any of your perspectives. And I will reveal my bias by saying I don't use social media. I don't believe in social media. I think that it's a sloppy and addictive social utility. Um, and I know that there's a distinction between my personal use of social media or any individual's personal use and how journalists use it as a tool or, or media organizations more generally. But I'm still interested in, and I know, Carolyn, you mentioned earlier that journalists are expected to, to use social media. It's a, it's a hugely important part of your role and your job these days. I understand that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious why we should think that social media is an appropriate platform for the dissemination of news. And I, I'm not, I know that there are some obvious things. You can access a huge demographic very easily. It's convenient. It, it exists already. It's, it's sort of a pre-existing infrastructure. But I'm curious how you think about its, its limitations as journalists, how much confidence you have in it. I'm, I'm thinking really about Facebook and Twitter. I don't think any of you are posting stories on LinkedIn on a regular <laughs> basis, though maybe I'm mistaken. But I'd be curious. I know there's a lot of talk about the last election and how social media was maybe a negative influence on the dissemination of news. But how do you think about that in the context of your own jobs? Well, I would start by saying um, you may have seen the survey by Pew, which showed that 44% of adults in this country get their news through Facebook. Um, so it's an astounding number. Um, and, you know, we have to be where our readers are, and uh, we can't retreat from that. Uh, but I do think that you're hitting on something that I think about a lot, and uh, we certainly discuss a lot um, in terms of social media and the kind of addictive and draining quality, um, especially during the campaign. I mean, some of my, I started counting, which is probably not a good thing, but um, some of my reporters would be tweeting um, more than 50 times a day. And one thing that would happen uh, when they got tired is, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but um, people start trolling you oh, and you start so arguing in front of the public um, yep. with, you know, uh, somebody who has maybe seven followers and like one is their mom and or like, is a bot. <laughs> just like, yeah. and, or more you know, likely a bot. In the, and there's mm -hmm. just like a degrading quality to it. So it kind of, to me, falls into this category of like, to what degree do we um, make ourselves accessible? So uh, I do think that we have to be present in places where our readers are. Uh, but I do really worry about it, and I think sometimes in those moments when you're fatigued, when you're angry, when you're getting attacked, you end up saying things that um, don't discredit you but kind of diminish you. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't think, I mean, we're not in a position economically, business-wise, where we can swear off social media. Um, you know, I don't know if my colleague Kim Severson is here, but 
uh, she was covering an execution and like very powerfully tweeting and we were sort of following her, featuring her tweets uh, during this evening when we we're expecting this execution and uh, we need to use all these tools and we need to reach our readers wherever they are but um, I think you're hitting on something that we do debate a lot and that we worry about. We're going to go to, we probably can squeeze in two I'll, more questions, Can Julie? I just say one more thing about that? Um, you said Maybe that one more you question don't, now. You don't, yeah. in, you, you don't believe in social media. I once had a friend who said, I don't believe in Delaware. I never met anybody from there. I mean, it's, it's part, it's there. You're spitting against the wind. If you don't. Um, again, I'm going to just turn it around. You have to know how to read it. You can't read it like a newspaper. You know, when you're listening, you know, there was a time in, in Boston after the, the, uh, the bombing, we, uh, you know, we just wanted to see what it would be like just to listen to the police radio for a while. They don't know what's going on. You repeat what the police radio says, you're just repeating speculation and guessing. And a lot of that is the case with Twitter, which reporters do rely on and often very well, using the proper vetting tools and circumnambulating the, you know, the locations and things. It's, it's a kind of a literacy that we haven't quite developed yet. It's useful, but all of us have to learn how to read it. And just one very quick point. Uh, the somewhat limited loss of life in Harvey is in part due, officials are saying, to the dominance of social media and the fact that they could get information to people in different channels in a way that they couldn't during Katrina. So there are some beneficial uses to it. Okay. Try to be fast. Um, what he said about Brooke and on the media, we should start a fan club or a support group or something. Did you, did you um, seed the audience? Is that what you did? Or invite people in to talk yeah. about you? <laughs> you don't have to. That's my sister. <laughs> That's my nephew. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about objectivity tonight, and actually there was a great on the media program about um, journalists avoiding going to marches and sorts of things like that to avoid the appearance of lacking objectivity to their readers. And I come from the academic world where we declare every time we publish something to a scholarly audience what our conflicts of interests are. And this is to an audience that could much more easily discover those than an audience that journalists usually publish to. And I'm wondering, what are the solutions to sort of declaring um, the, the lack of objectivity? Because everybody has it, but do you have ideas for that? Right. Is anyone uh, exploring that? You know, there's this uh, internet visionary named uh, Weinberger who said that uh, disclosure is the new objectivity. Back in the day when there only were a few uh, outlets and you couldn't be finding things out all the time, uh, if you just didn't act like you had an opinion, uh, that made you trustworthy. Now it has the opposite result. So it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's better, you know, it's a style that, it's a style that Bob and I have to own our opinions and then argue them as honestly and fairly and don't edit to win the argument and that kind of stuff. But to avoid the kind of circumlocutions of the past like, what do you say to the people who say blah, 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 when you're the one who's saying it, you know? That kind of thing. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it's faster and it's showing trust in your audience. Now, maybe they don't trust you. I mean, there have been studies that said you can just take a, a, a travel piece and if you put a Fox logo on it, Republicans will like it a lot more than Democrats. If you put an NPR logo on it, which is what they did, then uh, Democrats will like that more, the, but uh, the uh, Republicans will hate it a lot more than the Democrats hated the uh, the Fox logo travel piece, which they acknowledged was a neutral piece. So you're sort of sunk already. So I think you might as well trust the people who are taking in your information with who you are a little bit. Don't make yourself the story, but don't pretend you don't exist, that you're just some sort of omniscient bit of wind out there. And I think that's where you begin to find a solution. I actually wonder if in some way the, the, social, the role of social media for journalists might be disclosing that to, to people who read their work. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding new potential, potential sources of fake news. Okay. So, uh -huh. potential sources of fake news. So, I'm wondering if any of you <clears throat> have listened to the um, episode of Radiolab, the podcast, mm -hmm. a few 
months ago, they introduced um, new technologies that can manipulate audio and video. So now um, Adobe has new software that can actually do Photoshop for audio when you have 20 or 40 minutes of a person's audio recording, you can basically create new sentences out of that person's voice. And there is also new technology that um, you can manipulate people's facial expressions. So when you combine that with a new audio manipulation, it's really hard to figure out what kind of audio or video is real or fake. So I'm wondering if news organizations like you are um, preparing any measures against these new sources of fake news and fake media. I mean, it's a really interesting question. The, um, I, I'm, I come from the world of politics, political journalism, and one thing that they have found, um, partly because there's so much distrust of the media and politicians, that the one thing that remains powerful when you put it in a political ad, and you probably saw this with Mitt Romney, is if there's video, if you're overhearing somebody say something like, the 47 percent, that there's still like a potency to that. So one thing that we are doing, um, we had a big story that was really built around a candidate and what was captured on video. So a lot of what we're doing technologically is uh, vetting that in ways, more sophisticated ways, to see if there's any kind of alteration, uh, to see if there's been any kind of manipulation, any um, editing that would compromise the integrity of the product, of the video. Um, so um, it's, it's a worrisome trend because, I, like I said, I think for the public, even though they might distrust now text and the written word, um, there's something that still seems truthful when you hear somebody say it. So um, I do think that this is going to create all the more challenges for us. I was just going to say, I think that's fascinating that you're doing all that vetting. And it is. It's a terrifying prospect. Uh, they used to call that Photoshopification. But the, the biggest fear of that uh, isn't so much that people will believe things that aren't true, but that they can now freely dismiss things that are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the biggest threat. Look, I have to... Uh... I have to deliver some very bad news, which is this conversation has to finally come to an end. But a couple oh. housekeeping things first. Um, the Sorry. authors here will be um, signing books afterwards. If you, they, they'll, you can go out in the lobby, and I think you'll be directed over to this side. Um, you, you know, this stuff costs money to do great journalism, so buy their books so they can keep doing it. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being here tonight, and let's hear it for our panel.